OSPF neighbor relationships, the nitty gritty. Before we get started, can I just make a quick statement? There are no configuration commands in this nugget, and I am honestly proud of that fact. The reason why is this nugget really emphasized the difference between an average network technician and an excellent technician. There are those who can go in and set up OSPF and type the commands and make it work, which is good, but there are those who can do that and then figure out what's going on when things are not working correctly. And I've been in enough network situations where the whole system down, all eyes on you, and you go, oh my goodness, I don't even know what to do. And that is one of the worst feelings in the world. That's what this nugget is here to prevent. You understand the how OSPF works because that's the key to understanding how to fix it if things are going wrong. So let's start off. OSPF, when you first start it up, so you go in router OSPF 5 and then start typing in your configuration commands, the first thing the router does is determine its name or its router ID. Essentially, anytime it goes and tries to form a neighbor relationship, the hello messages will say, hi, my name is, and that's where the router ID comes in. By default, it will be the highest IP address on a physical interface with the, with the caveat that loopback interfaces always win. So by default, if I had this router right here, 192.168.1.1 would be the router ID, but but if I went in and put in a loopback interface and put 1.1.1.1, that would be the router ID, and that would be the name that it uses when it introduces itself to all the other routers. There's rule number one. The name must be unique in the entire topology of OSPF. So if you've got a router that just strangely is not forming a neighbor relationship with another router, it may just be that you have a duplicated router ID. Once the router has chosen its router ID, it will start adding interfaces to the link state database based on whichever ones you've identified using the network command or gone under the interface itself and said, I want to run OSPF on this interface. Now, you remember there's two things that happen when you do that. One, it starts sending hello messages on that interfaces, on that interface. And then the second thing it does is advertise that network. I'll just put advertise network um, to where if this is the 10.1.1.0 network, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to send hello messages out on that interface to try and form a neighbor over there. But the second thing it's going to do is start advertising this network to other routers. Maybe there's another router out here and it's going to say, hey, I now know about the 10.1.1 network. It's really a multi multi-function command. So, it says, okay, I've, I've seen what interfaces are going to be active. Now let's send hello messages. Hello, anybody out there? It sends those to a multicast address. Based on what type of network interface you're connected to, it will determine the frequency. There's probably a totally better way of saying that, but you get the concept, right? So on broadcast, meaning Ethernet style networks or point-to-point -point networks, it's going to say hello once every 10 seconds. On non-broadcast multi-access networks like Frame Relay, it's going to say hello once every 30 seconds. Now, that may seem like an insignificant point, but that's actually the number one thing that causes an OSPF neighbor relationship to fail is that the hello timers are mismatched. See, when it sends out the hello message, it's not just saying hello. It actually is sending an envelope full of all kinds of information that you can see right here. The ones with the asterisks, well, actually, er, scratch that out. That's a typo. The ones with an asterisk has to match between them, meaning they have to have the same hello and dead or what's known as the hold down timers. Otherwise, the neighbor relationship will not form. They have to have the same subnet mask on their interface. Otherwise, the neighbor relationship won't form. They have to be in the same area. You get the idea, right? Same authentication password or else the neighbor relationship won't form. This slide represents your number one troubleshooting slide for OSPF. Neighbor relationship is not forming, almost guaranteed it's going to be one of these kind of things. Otherwise, it would be some kind of connectivity failure between the two. So the routers have identified which interfaces are going to run OSPF. They've packaged up their hello and sent it on its way. Now, we'll just say router 2 receives that hello first thing it does is check it out. Rips open that envelope and it's like, all right, am I compatible with this guy? Uh, let's see. Hello and dead. Good. Okay. Subnet mask. Good. Area ID. Good. Password. Good. We are compatible. Or if any one of these is wrong, let's just say the hello timer on this side is nine seconds and his is 10 seconds. He's like, eh, not going to happen. And you'll see that when you do a show IP OSPF neighbor, neighbor shows up and disappears. Shows up, disappears, shows up. So that's how you know you have a bouncing relationship. You got to go in and compare both sides to make sure that they are set exactly the same. Once he realizes it's compatible, he's going to ask the question, okay, is this a brand new neighbor? And the way he knows that is he looks at his list of neighbors and compares it to the ID and the, and the hello packet. You know, the router ID is in there. And he goes, oh, okay, yes, I already know about you. Or maybe it's a brand new neighbor that I need to add in there. 
most of the time, it's going to be this. It's an existing neighbor, and he just has to go in and reset the dead timer. Because remember, these are sent on Ethernet networks once every 10 seconds. So it goes, okay, I've received a hello. It's kind of keep alive uh, between the two. It goes, okay, then I will not consider you dead for another 40 seconds. Okay, you know, another 10 seconds pass, it receives another hello. Okay, I've reset your dead timer. I've reset your dead timer. So it's always going to be resetting that because if this guy stops sending hellos, he knows he's down and he's going to find alternate routes. So the neighbor relationship is formed. Now we've got to send the data between the two. The next step in the process is determining the master and slave relationship. And I've seen people really get hung up on this. It's not a big deal at all. Essentially, the routers talk to each other and they say, okay, how about you send your data first? That's really all there is in a master-slave relationship. And just some perspective on you. Keep in mind, OSPF 30 years ago was developed, right? 30 years ago, a time when 300 baud modems uh, lived everywhere. And like every bit of bandwidth was, oh man, we can't. If you send two hello messages within that, that interval, that's too much. I mean, nowadays, the 30 years later, a lot of the constraints like processing power and bandwidth are in nowhere close to the same shape they were 30 years ago, right? So some of these steps that you have to use that perspective. So you can either set manually the, the uh, master slave by saying this guy has the higher priority or what most people do is just let the router ID break the tie. The higher router ID becomes the master and he will be the one to send his DBD first. DBD being the description of the OSPF database, kind of like a, a cliff note summary right? Rather than sending all the detailed information and eating up too much bandwidth on that 300 baud connection, again, perspective is huge, right? We'll just send a quick summary of the database, uh, the topology table, essentially is all that is, to the slave and let him process it, and then allow him to ask for what's left by sending his DBD packet over uh, the other direction. Again, saying, here's the summary of what the slave knows about. Once the DBDs are reviewed, they began this little ticky-tacky game of sending LSRs and LSU. So essentially, this guy sent a DBD uh, saying, I know about, let's just give an example, the 10.1.1.1 uh, network. I know about 10.1.2, 10.1.3, 4, 5. You know, I know about all these kind of things. So that flies over. That's the DBD. Flies over here, and the slave's like, okay, I got that one. I got that one. I knew about that. Ooh. I didn't know about 10.1.4.0. Hang on, L let, me, let me ask some more information. Excuse me, uh, master, <laughs> router one, whatever the, the router ID is. Um, could you send me some more information about 10.1.4.0? Because that one's not in my database. This guy goes, oh yeah, sure, no problem. Let me send you an LSU, LSU, that contains all the information about that 10.1.4. I've known about it this long. This is the next hop. This is the cost. You know, all, all of that detailed information is sent over the slave and he goes great that's fantastic thank you uh, not not shown in this picture uh, ls ack is sent back saying got it thank you so much for that information uh, and so they play this game back and forth so a bunch of lsrs a bunch of lsus until both of them are up to date once the routers reach that full synchronized state, they are considered full neighbors. And that's what you want to see when you do a show IP OSPF neighbor command. You want to see all your neighbors listed with full sitting right next to them, meaning there's no problems at all. Understanding that neighbor relationship, as I mentioned at the beginning, is key to your troubleshooting. And I know when you first see it, it can be a little overwhelming. Let me just take 30 seconds and review it, and you'll be like, oh, that's not, not bad. What's the first thing that these routers send? Hello, right? Hello? Hello. They check and see if they're compatible. They are. They pick the master and slave, and he goes, okay, I'll send you my summary. DBD. Here's the summary of what I know about. Slave says, here's a summary of what I know about. They review them. They go, oh, okay, well, got most of that information. Ooh, there's a route I don't know about. So it sends a link state request. Hey, I don't know about the 10.1.1 network. Uh, can you let me know about that? This guy goes, yeah, sure. Uh, here's a link state update containing all the information for that. They keep doing that. They keep going back and forth with those until they reach that fully synchronized state. See? Not too bad, is it? Each one of these states that it goes through is assigned a name. Like, for instance, when they first are uh, initializing the uh, neighbors, they, they go into a init state, right, when they send the hello messages. Once they've realized they, are, they can be uh, neighbors, they go into uh, briefly an X start. That's where they're uh, picking the master-slave relationship. And then they go into an exchange state. And when you, you might be wondering, where do you see these states? debug messages. You'll actually see them as they pass through the states. So they go through the exchange, and then once they're doing this LSR, LSU deal, they're going into a loading state. That means they're loading the database between each other. Then they finally reach the full state. That knowledge 
is what separates, as I mentioned at the beginning, the normal network engineer from the excellent network engineer. Because you can go in, turn on a debug IP OSPF neighbors, and be like, oh man, it, it gets to this point in the state and then hangs up and goes back. Why is that? Start your research there or start realizing, oh, well, that could be because uh, there's some duplication in the router ID or that could be because there's a mismatch in the hello packet, you know, all those kind of things. You could uh, really get into that nitty gritty troubleshooting. Once these neighbors form and they're in that full state, now it, that's when you run the SP algorithm and figure out what to do with that data and what that means in plain English is you generate your routing table and after you've got that routing table now data begins to flow throughout the network you now know how OSPF neighbor relationships form I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing